Welcome to the Clarence Church of Christ online worship experience. We're glad you've joined us. If you would, consider subscribing. We hope you enjoy and can engage with God to hear the things he has for you. Easter to you all. We're so glad you're here with us this morning. For those of you at home, we miss you. Happy Easter. Please stand and sing with us as we start uh, the hymn music with Lo in the Grave He Lay, page 165. Page 163. 
Christ the Lord is risen today. Yes, Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead and that day, that Easter Sunday morning, that first Easter, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome went to the grave expecting to anoint a dead body. They saw the angel sitting there and they said, where is Jesus? The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. I submit to you tonight that that's the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He has conquered the grave. He's alive. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there's more proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than almost any other fact in Roman history. I don't believe there's a fact in ancient history today so well proven as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But even if there was no proof, no historical proof, no scientific proof and there is i would still believe it because i believe this book is god's inspired word and the whole early church went up and down the country preaching the resurrection of jesus christ that was the thing that shook the roman empire that a man had risen from the dead that he was alive that death could not hold him christ is alive he's a living savior He is risen. When you hear that during the service, all you have to say back in the aisle is, He is risen indeed. So let's try that. He is risen. He is risen indeed. One more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. He has. Stand up and sing with us.
He is risen. He is risen. Amen. John 14, 1 through 4. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare, prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Today we have great joy in our hearts, knowing our Lord made the sacrifice for all, all of us and overcame death. That is why all Christians around the world are celebrating this day. He has prepared a place for all who believe and have placed their hope in him. But we also know there are others that have not heard or have heard and turned away. Would you join me and take this time to pray for the lost? Our Heavenly Father, we come before you now celebrating with joyous hearts that you overcame death, that you took our sin and buried it once and for all. But Lord, we know there are others in this world, many others, who haven't even heard of your name. Lord, I ask you to be with those who are reaching out to them, with our missionaries, with everyone here who touches a heart throughout the week that you would give them the strength, the wisdom, the words to say, to inspire them to look toward you. And Lord, I ask you to be with those who have heard of you, but have turned away. Would you soften their hearts? Would, their open, would you open their minds to realize that you are the true one and only God? You have given your life for us. We didn't deserve it, but you gave it to us. Lord, thank you. Thank you for opportunities you will give us. Thank you for giving us the ability to reach everyone in this world. Thank you for this time as we celebrate your resurrection. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.
me sing a solo and he asked me a while back and I had a song picked for about a month and about four days ago I had to go to Bender's to pick up something for the Good Friday service and God changed my entire thought process because within a day eight different times either somebody called and told me about the song or I heard it or just kept playing in my ear that God was telling me I'm alive you need to praise me stop being so somber so I changed my song to an old hymn that touches me every single time I hear it, so I hope you enjoy it too. <laughs>
What did the soldiers put in front of Jesus' tomb? A rock. The rock? A big stone. A rock. A rock. A big huge rock. A border. What do you think Jesus did when he was in the tomb? Nothing. I don't know. Hi. He was playing a game. He too did. Being born. I did I know. He was turning into a skeleton. Turned himself a rock. I think he is turning back to life. In three days. How do you think Jesus came out of the tomb? Uh, angel. He sneaked past it. What happened to the rock? Broke. Okay, Ted. How did Jesus turn me out of the tomb? Do. The angel warned him, like to go back up because he can't breathe underground. Did he have on when he came out of the tomb? Um, a blue dress. He, Jesus came back alive, and it and. And it was a miracle. I think he came out of the tomb by angels. Angels carried him down. I think it said, God's alive in heaven. How do you think the angel told the women at the tomb that Jesus is alive? Yeah. <laughs> by praying? Jesus, you're alive. Like him a kiss? She came out of the sky and told him that he was alive. Jesus is back alive. He he told them a lie. They lie. Jesus, his body was gone in the tomb. Jesus is alive. Like that. John 20, 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Then they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. Good morning, welcome, really nice to see you. Do you remember where you were a year ago and what you were doing on Easter Sunday? What a bummer, huh? It is so nice to be back together in a public worship celebrating what the Lord's done for us. Let's give thanks before we continue, okay? Father, we thank you for the freedom to gather in public worship of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We thank you 
that this event that many of us have celebrated for many years uh, perhaps has come routine, but a year's absence sure showed us how vital and important it is into our life. We missed a year. Grateful we can celebrate every Lord's Day, your resurrection, but it's cool to do this as the culture does all together. Father, I pray today that your spirit would move in this place, that the events described in the scripture would stir our hearts once again, that it would be fresh and new. Let your word, Father, have a powerful effect on our faith, whether our faith is big and lifelong or small and just starting out. Father, we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of my favorite places is Mountain View Christian Camp, and one of my favorite games at Mountain View Christian Camp is Tug of War. Got to be one of the greatest games ever. This game is not endorsed by the National Health Institute because sometimes it results in minor injuries. You know how that goes. Minor if it happens to you and major if it happens to me. That's, that's the definition of that. There's plenty of variations of tug of war, but the best one is when the staff challenges the campers. It seems like there's no way the campers can win this battle. It usually comes down to eight or 10 or so athletic, enthusiastic faculty members who are inexperienced and haven't suffered minor injuries yet. You know, those kind of people. And they're on this side and they're talking and talk and they're big and they're strong. And over here are approximately 30 or so elementary age kids. And the adults get the biggest guy to take the end of the rope. He's the anchor man. You know how that goes? And he wraps the rope around his torso a couple times. And he digs in and he gets a good grip on it. And then the others take their place in front of him. And it's just, they're confident. It, it's just like there's no way they can lose, you know? There's no way. Uh, they're bigger, they're stronger, they have strategy, they're organized. And these little rug rats are enthusiastic, but they're jibber-jabbering like a bunch of chickens in the hen house, you know, and they're black, 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 and they're, they're disorganized, and they, they're clueless. You already know what's going to happen. They're going to get destroyed, right? They are going to get destroyed. Well, quiet everybody down. Quiet down now. Here's the rules. There's a hanky in the middle. And the hanky needs to go this way for you to win and this way for them to win. There's a mark on the ground. To pull it past that mark on the ground and you'll be the winner. Everybody get it? Yeah, you got it? Okay, everybody pick up the rope. Draw the rope tight. Okay, you ready? I'm going to blow the whistle now and back out of the way. Off we go. And immediately, the staff gains the momentum. You know, one jerk and the kids are moving this way. And it looks like it's just going to be seconds until it's over. But 60 little arms and legs are stronger than 16 bigger arms and legs. And the face of the anchor man at the end of the rope looks like he just ate sushi doused with Frank's red hot sauce. It's like, that look, you know. And the force eventually pulls the staff out of their footholds and they start moving this way towards the kids. And it's just, just a minute and they're done. Once the momentum starts, there's no stopping the kids. It's like pulling a root out of the ground. And once it starts coming, get out of the way. And the mighty staff with all their muscles, goes down to defeat. And the kids celebrate and jump around and start talking trash to the defeated staff, and it's a beautiful thing. And, oh yeah, they're suffering minor injuries as they go, what just happened to us? I, I love that picture because that is the resurrection in my mind. There's a tug, and, tug of war between life and death. And it's pretty clear that Jesus has already lost. I mean, the grip of death put Jesus in the tomb. Even the kids get it. It was covered with a giant rock. It was guarded by experienced soldiers. From all outward appearances, 
it looked like it was over before it started, right? His best friends thought so. But keeping Jesus down was like trying to stop the sun from rising. Good luck with that. Nothing could keep him in the grave. Not Satan, not the government, not a heavy stone, not an experienced squadron of soldiers, not death. And so today, we celebrate because if that happened, if Jesus rose from the dead, then we can too. He was the first fruits. That's what the New Testament calls him. He, he was the first fruit. But more fruit is coming. And look around the room today at all the fruit that came after Jesus. How do I know this is true? Well, uh, every Bible, I'm sorry, every Bible mentions the story that it happened. Every Bible story of the resurrection includes the fact that it happened on the first day of the week. Until that time, uh, the Sabbath day was the day. That's when people rested. That's when people uh, brought their sacrifice. That's when, they, that's when they honored God, the seventh day, the traditional day. It was one of the Ten Commandments, right? The fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day. But when Jesus rose, everything changed. The first day, called the Lord's Day. Yeah, I mean, how would you like to be so amazing, so cool that they just named a day after you that happened every day of the week. Joy day, you know, Mike day. Not Tuesday, not Monday, whatever. Just beautiful. The Lord's day every Sunday. And so from that time on we, we our calendar is affected by the resurrection. It used to be back in the day that Sundays were in red. I know secular people take that out now, but if you see a calendar that has red on it, why is that Sunday red? So from the day we worship to the day we count years, 2021, from when? From what? Well, based on the life of Christ. The whole rhythm of our life is changed by what happened on that first day of the week. They all mention it because they want you to remember. How do you know this is true? Well, how do you know that a huge container ship blocked the Suez Canal last week for six days? How do you know that is true? Well, there were people on the scene that were reporting what they saw, right? We just accept that. The same is true with the empty tomb. The first eyewitnesses were as skeptical as they could be. And even, Joe, even though Jesus predicted three times that he would rise, they didn't come to the tomb and say, oh yeah, just, just like he said. Yep, just like he said. He's gone. No, not that. They concluded that the body was stolen. And so if you came today skeptical about all this, thinking it's a fairy tale, hey, join the crowd. You fit right in with the first eyewitnesses on the crime scene. John tells us that, as, as you heard read, that Mary Magdalene was the first to arrive at the tomb. And the other gospel writers name at least three other ladies as well. But you might wonder why John focuses only on Mary and leaves out the others. He's writing later in his life, and he, probably the simple reason is that Mary was the first to tell Peter and John that the body of Jesus was missing. That's how he remembers the story. So he writes what he remembers. The women were coming to complete the burial process. They were expecting to find what? Soldiers, a big rock, a seal on the rock, and eventually the grisly body of Jesus. Now before this Mary met Jesus, she came from a town called Magdalene, Magdala. And so uh, it's, a, it's a small town up by the Sea of Galilee, the big lake there. So Mary Magdalene, like, like uh, Irene of Akron or like Casey of Williamsville, that, that kind of name, that's all that means. Mary was at the cross, consider this, she was at the cross when Jesus died. She was there at the tomb when his body was placed within it. And now she returns on this Sunday morning to complete the burial. What 
a job was ahead of her. So he had to confront soldiers. They had to somehow move a stone, and she had to enter into this this, uh, place where nobody wants to go. Wow. But when she arrived, the soldiers were absent. The stone had been moved, and the body was missing. And what in the world is going on here? Her first thought was that someone had stolen the body. So she quickly left to go tell Peter and John. The other women, from what we get in the other Gospels, remained at the tomb long enough to learn from the angel that the body wasn't stolen, but that Jesus had actually risen from the dead, like he said. And so they also left to go tell the story. Meanwhile, Mary is on her way, and she reports, as Rachel read for us, They've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. That's all she knows. That's the information she has. Can you imagine that for just a second? Many of us have lost loved ones since we last celebrated Easter together. Can you imagine the funeral director calling you up to say, I regret to inform you that we have misplaced the body of your loved one. And you start, what kind of operation? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but uh, we're looking for it. We we don't know where it is right now. We're doing our best and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. I mean, the anger in you and the resentment and the frustration, I mean, the indignity of it all. Oh, what in the world? And, and remember, Peter and John were on the most wanted list at this point. But they came out of hiding on that Sunday morning because they had to see for themselves what was going on. And so upon arrival, they looked intently like NCIS checking out the crime scene. And The Bible tells us that Peter focused on one thing. I mean, yes, it was empty, but he focused on one thing. It was the grave clothes. The grave clothes. What in the world is going on with that? I mean, think about it. If if you had the nerve to approach soldiers, if you had the nerve to move the stone and the nerve to steal the body, Would you take time to remove the clothes and fold them neatly and leave them behind? I mean, think about it. Somebody is out there running around with a naked corpse. How how weird is that? It's just weird. The, The crime scene is a weird crime scene. The body's gone. The clothing's left behind. One writer imagines the clothing something like a snake skin. The body has disappeared leaving the skin of the snake, the clothing collapsed in its place right right where it's supposed to be. Another writer imagines Jesus or one of the angels coming in and folding up the clothing and putting them back in place. But the question remains, who, who would do this? What happened here? I know from my reading, probably yours too, grave robbing was a big thing back in the day in the 1800s the medical industry craved uh, remains, human remains, for scientific research. They they wanted to study. They wanted to know. And so they could teach others. They could learn from it. And, of course, other people robbed graves because they were after whatever treasure they thought might be there. Um, But grave robbers don't usually clean up after themselves. They just kind of leave a mess, and they're off. In Jesus' tomb, there was this neatness and this order. Very, very strange. The evidence here just doesn't add up. The Bible says that John believed. Well, what what did he believe? I think it just means simply he believed what Mary told him, that the body was missing. That's all he knew at this point. Looking back, John says the reason there was reason to believe that Jesus rose I mean, because he predicted it. But John says in verse 9, at this point, they just didn't get it. They would later in the day, but not right now. It's just too much. John wants our attention on Mary. She stands there 
alone, weeping. Okay, this is not Mary, the sister of Lazarus that some of you might equate. Or this is not the Mary that anointed Jesus with the expensive perfume. Not, not either of those. This was Mary, Mary quite contrary. That was this Mary. The one who was controlled by demonic forces in her former life. The terrible things that she experienced. Boy. She, but then she was set free by Jesus to enjoy the goodness of God. And so she became, out of her grateful heart, a follower of Jesus. Whatever he needed, that's what she did. And that's what the t scriptures tell us about her, that she just followed, and she followed him all the way to this tomb. If you can put yourself in her sandals for just a minute, I mean, what a morning for her already. The day is only a couple hours old, and she's drained. She's thinking a couple days backwards of the death of Jesus, now the missing body, now running to tell the story, grieving and confused, now back at the tomb. Um, she looked into the tomb herself like Peter did, and to her shock, she saw these two figures, these two angels sitting where Jesus' body had been. They were described elsewhere in, in the Gospels as men whose clothes gleamed like lightning. Ooh, we're squinting now into a dark tomb. We're squinting crazy. Most of the time in the Bible, when people see angels, they fall on the ground, right? That's usually the response. They just fall on the ground. But this time, the angel doesn't let her. There's a question. There's a question. What, why are you crying? Why are you crying? Well, they've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've put him. Confused, obligated now to her friend to find him and give him a proper burial. But something, the Bible doesn't say, but something caused her to turn around, and lo and behold, there was behind her some unrecognizable person. A couple years back, I went to the funeral of a childhood friend down in Ohio and I walked into a very busy and crowded room and saw to my surprise a bunch of old people a bunch of old people there and what the heck is going on here man uh, one guy came right up to me greeted me by name greeted me warmly and started talking I had I had no idea who it was um, have you been there when somebody knows you and you don't know them? And that's like, uh, how do you hide that? How do you get by that? Um, this guy I had not seen in 45 years. And uh, a friend that I did know came over and joined us, and he apparently saw my puzzled look, and he introduced me to my classmate of 12 years who I played basketball with for eight years and all these memories, and I go, oh, awkward. Oh, man, yeah, how are you, buddy? That kind of stuff. Sorry. Why didn't Mary recognize Jesus? I mean, it hadn't been that long. It hadn't been 45 years. It only been a couple days. Well, she wasn't expecting to see him, first of all. She was in deep grief. Uh, she had just seen two angels. I mean, this was already the strangest morning of her life. The last time she saw Jesus, he was dead. That couldn't be him. That, that eliminates him from the, from the list of characters. Ha, has this happened to you? You walk into the room and you say, Honey, have you seen my car keys? Uh, they're in your hand. Um, hey, have you guys seen my glasses? Yeah, they're right up here on the top of your head. Oh, oh. Th that's a merry moment. Let's just call it a, not a senior moment, but a merry moment. And that's it for right now. She thinks this must be the caretaker of the place. I don't know him, but he must know something about what's going on here. She, maybe he saw something. Let me ask. Tell me where you put him and I'll, I'll get him. Now, just a moment break here. If you have a friend like Mary, you are, you are golden. Uh, how fortunate you must be to have someone like that in your life, devoted and loyal and servant-hearted and looking out for your best interest all the time. She isn't the star of the show. But boy, she sure is good. 
The stranger calls Mary by name. I, I don't know, just fantasize with me. How did, how did that sound? Did he shout it? Did he whisper it? Did she know? How did she know it was Jesus? How did he say it so she knew? Was it his familiar voice? I have always wondered about that. But she knew immediately, didn't she? Man, the goosebumps that go up and down your back. She just said, teacher. Now you guys know in hockey, three goals in one game is called a hat trick, right? A hat trick. Mary was witness to the greatest hat trick in the history of hat tricks. One, she saw Jesus die on the cross. Two, she saw Jesus buried in the tomb. And three, she was the first to meet him, encounter him after he rose. That is a hat trick right there, buddy. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. And the scriptures leave Mary right there. They don't tell any more of her story. Uh, they don't record her writing a letter to the churches they don't record her public speaking in any form. But I'll bet she sat around a thousand campfires telling her story of what she saw and the greatest hat trick of all time. I was there. I saw him. Mark chapter 16 verse 9 explains that Mary was the first to see the risen Lord and so she became the first messenger to report the news. The body of Jesus wasn't stolen. I saw him. He's alive. You know, eight strong faculty members at camp are no match for 30 disorganized campers. They're just no match. It seems like they would be, but they aren't in a tug-of-war contest. And death is no match for the living God. Give it, a, give it your best shot. Give it your best shot. Let's just see what happens. So the resurrection gives us this new hope, this new life, this new message. We've got something to say now. The Bible talks about two kinds of death. There's the one that we're most familiar with right now when we lose a loved one, the loss of physical life. And uh, it's horrible, but it happens to every one of us. But there's a second death called the spiritual death, right? And this is the eternal death. This is the separation from God forever. The wages of sin is death. It's a spiritual death. When Jesus won the tug of war with death, he broke the power of sin and the grave. And everything changed. His death on the cross canceled, canceled our sin. It took it out. It took it away. And his rising guarantees our forgiveness. And so we can be released from this pending second death. Jesus makes alive those who were dead in their sins. That's what the scriptures say in Ephesians. So we are all going to suffer the first death unless the Lord comes back in our lifetime. We're going to suffer that first death. Yes, we will. And yes, we can escape the second death. Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet, predicted the incredible work of Jesus with these amazing words from Isaiah chapter 25. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. Well, that's one of those underlinable passages of Scripture. Isaiah 25, 10. When Jesus greeted his disciples later that Sunday night, he said something really cool. It sounds like a traditional greeting, like if you or I came into a room that people weren't expecting us and we surprised them with our presence, we'd probably have some crazy thing to say. Hey, what's up? Yo, I'm here. Hello. Let's say something crazy like that. I don't know. And Jesus went with the traditional, peace be with you. Well, that's what I thought, traditional. 
peace be with you. But boy, he's saying a lot more than a traditional greeting here. With the help of the New Testament, now we see there's deeper significance. Peace be with you. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're a child of God. We're no longer enemies. We're no longer at war. We're no longer far away. We're no longer separated. Because of what we did, we have peace with God. The second death is no longer a part of our future because the sin, sin and death have been defeated. It's so cool when he says, peace be with you. Man, do you know that peace? We have a new hope, a new life, and a new message. So now Mary's pedometer is on overdrive. I mean, this girl's putting in some steps on this morning, and she's gone fast. She went back to the disciples with this news. I have seen the Lord. It's kind of interesting if you step back and look at it. Why would Jesus choose this girl? A girl's testimony in New Testament times was not considered valid. Jesus chose this girl from a small town with a messed up past to be his first witness. Why did he do that? It's the way of the Lord, isn't it? That's just the way of the Lord. If you think you're something, he probably won't use you. But he loves to take nobodies. He loves to choose the simple things of this world to confound the wise. That's the way he does his business. So, if you think you're a nobody today, if you think you're insignificant, forgotten, left out, broken, wow, you are in a good spot to be used by Almighty God. I have a little exercise for you right now. I would like you, for the first time in the history of church, to take out your phone. Yep, take it out right now. Turn on the ringer and turn on your phone. You can do that. You have my permission to do that right now. Take it out, because I want you to be like Mary. I, I want you to send a text to somebody right now and leave your ringer on, okay? Send a text that says, He is risen, or Christ the Lord is risen today, or put it in your words however you would like to say it, but pick out somebody, preferably outside your family, somebody outside your family that's not aware, just or maybe someone who's missing, missing church today. Send it to somebody and just say he's risen. And let's just leave it on and let's just hear how the message of the risen Lord bounces from phone to phone to phone all over wherever. Cyberspace, I guess. I can't give a region. But the message goes, you, okay, so you have permission to unsilence your phone. You guys who don't have phones, don't use smoke signals, but do this later, okay? Just do something later. Um, Later, Jesus would say these words to, to his, his guys, which he's saying to you. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. He sends us with new hope to a hopeless world and new life to a dying world and a new message to a confused world. As the scriptures say, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. I'm getting ready to close here, but I just want to remind you what that's beautiful. I love to hear those responses, man. The message spreads around and around. He's risen. John said, he, he gave a reason for him writing his book. He went to all the trouble to write his book because he said, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. This does not mean that you believe Jesus was like George Washington, a famous man. It's more than that. You recognize him as the living God, the Lord Almighty, proven by his death, his burial, and his resurrection. I, I pray the joy of the risen Lord will overwhelm you and ripple out from you to the people around you in your world, just like it did Mary. He takes this broken girl from a small town with no hope and no purpose, and really no future, and he gives her new hope 
new life and a new message. Has that happened to you? The Bible says to complete this deal, you need to surrender your life to Christ. You need to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You need to repent and be baptized, showing your own death and your burial and your resurrection. I read this week, Max Lucado said, you know what baptism is? Baptism is kind of like a person um, buying a car. He says, you got the tire kickers, the people go out and lick the cars and kick the tires, and you got the car buyers. He says, baptism separates the tire kickers from the car buyers. You got to be all in here. You got to be all in. Your death, your burial, and your resurrection in Christian baptism. If you haven't done that, today's a perfect time to do it. Right now is a perfect time to do it. If you're not ready, we can do it this afternoon or tonight, whenever it works for you. But we'd love to talk with you about your own death, your own burial, and your resurrection. May the Lord bless you this day and keep you in the palm of your hand as you celebrate the incredible thing that happened on that Easter morning. Blessings on you.
If you would like to engage with what you've seen or would like to talk with someone further from our church, please go to clarencecc.org and there's a chat feature at the bottom of the page. You can click that and engage with somebody further. Thank you for joining us.